Uh, this is um, Cooking the Prairie Mediterranean Way. This is part two of our class series. And so welcome back. How many of you have come back for more? Oh, wow, wow, <laughs> I'm impressed, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here. And this is gonna be more of a fun day. You know, the last, the first class was more about, you know, the why and the what and the science of the Mediterranean diet. Now today's gonna be a lot more fun because we're gonna go shopping and we're gonna do some cooking and we're gonna do some meal planning. And so I think you're gonna really have more fun today. I hope you have fun. Um, I sure have been having fun. And so we're gonna get started um, in, uh, this is, uh, I think you will introduce myself, Joanne Shear Parkin, registered dietitian and nutritionist, um, and uh, passionate about the Mediterranean diet that we learned from last week is that um, my approach is uh, a modification of the Mediterranean diet because as you learned last week, last week you know farm girl and um, I feel like there's some great awesome Western foods farm foods that we can incorporate into that um, Mediterranean diet to make it actually something that we can actually find in terms of food and produce and able to really cook and prepare meals in uh, Mediterranean so I think what uh, the whole idea is that you want to pull in as much as you can of uh, the key concepts of that Mediterranean diet into our Western diet and overall have a healthier diet. That's the whole goal here, right? Is we want to be healthier, we want to feel good, we want to have energy, we want to be able to do more, and we also want to, you know, prevent uh, uh, the, the aging and chronic diseases, right? That's the whole thing. We want to stay as healthy as we can, we want to have good quality of life. That's what it's all about, and that is where you know, this good nutrition comes in because it's gonna make a big difference in your life and in your immune system, immunity. Didn't we learn that the last couple of years, how important our immune system is? And there's nothing better than just a really high octane fuel immune diet. So that's what this is. So let's get started. I think the, the first thing when you're switching to a Mediterranean diet is to look at what kind of fats and oils you have in your, your pantry. Now, I'm gonna be going through uh, what I have in my pantry, but it's important what's in your pantry. <laughs> so uh, you go home, whip, whip open the doors to the pantry mm -hmm. or the drawers or whatever, and start checking out what you have in your pantry. So uh, this is what I did uh, for preparation for this class. I went through and started pulling what I had in my pantry out and uh, took some photos of what's in my pantry. So the, the first thing I know that when I was working as a head dietitian at that cardiovascular hospital was the first thing that I did was get rid of the vegetable oils in the kitchen. And uh, I had my cooks prepare all of the salad dressings, dressings fresh. We didn't use any bottled uh, store-bought salad dressings because most of those store-bought salad dressings were made from soybean oil. Uh, what's wrong with soybean oil? and vegetable oils, uh, they're highly polyunsaturated. And what you learned in the last class is that oxidation and oxidative stress is bad for your body. Uh, that uh, can accelerate heart disease, and all kinds of chronic diseases. And so uh, polyunsaturated fats and vegetable oils are easily oxidized. So. Um, that's one thing to keep in mind. Remember oxidation, oxidative stress, bad for the body. So we don't want to consume oils that are oxidized. We don't want to consume oils that are rancid. Even if you're, like with, even with olive oil, it's, it's, it resists rancidity. It's more monounsaturated fat in there. So it's not as easily oxidized, but it can turn bad over time and become oxidized. So you want to go home and also smell your oils. Do they smell good? Do they smell fresh? If they smell rancid, throw them out. Um, you don't want to uh, consume rancid oils or your, or your nuts and seeds. They can turn rancid too because they have some polyunsaturated oils in them. So that's one thing. You want to buy and consume fresh oils. All of extra virgin olive oil being the best. Um, avocado oil is kind of the new kid on the block, in, in, uh, which is really, it's great. It has a similar nutrient profile and fatty acid profile similar to that of olive oil. So when I like and want to use a lighter oil, like let's say I'm making my buckwheat pancakes and want a little oil in them, I will put in a little uh, avocado oil. Or in baking where you need oil, you want a lighter oil. That's where I use the avocado oil. But for the most part, I will use um, 
extra virgin olive oil. And some people say, well, what about you know the smoke point on olive oil? Doesn't don't you have to be worried about that? Uh, <clears throat> new research shows that olive oil is resistant to degradation and uh, uh, a smoke point up to about 400 to 425 degrees. So you can still use extra virgin olive oil for roasting your vegetables. So that's another place where I use a lot of uh, the extra virgin olive oil. Now over, the, over here are some um, aged balsamic vinegars. This is how I make salad dressing. Drizzle some extra virgin olive oil on my greens, an aged balsamic vinegar, just drizzle that over top, a little fresh ground black pepper, sprinkle in little herbs if you want, throw in some berries and just toss it all together and you have a salad. Uh, that's really how easy it is for starting with salad dressings, is just to do something that simple. Another formula when you're making salad dressings is, uh, there's a little formula you can use. So remember this, three, you wanna write this down, three, two, one, okay? This is the way to start. Um, especially if you're not really fond of that tangy kind of taste of some of the, the olive oil and vinegar salad dressings and you're making them at home. Um, three, two, one. Basically, three tablespoons of your olive oil, two tablespoons of acid of some vinegar or lemon juice, and then a tablespoon of sweet. Now, that would be maybe honey. Basically, I do, if I sweeten up my salad dressings, I basically use a little honey. Um, some dress, you might be able to use a little uh, real natural maple syrup. Um, you could put in a little uh, like stevia if you wanted to and you wanted to not have add extra carbs, you can do that. I generally, if you have a really good aged uh, balsamic vinegar, they, they, as they age, they, you, they lose that kind of that tartness. Have you noticed that? Anybody buy those extra, extra, you know, those aged balsamics? Yes. They lose that kind of bite and sharpness. They become like more naturally sweet as they age. So that's a really good little formula. Then what you do is then you can add oh, crushed garlic to that. You can add a little Dijon mustard, maybe some herbs, your favorite herbs, maybe some Italian herbs, and you have a homemade salad dressing. Because I just like one with just the extra virgin olive oil, lemon juice, a little Dijon mustard. And uh, um, I just generally kind of like that little tartness. I don't add extra sweet uh, myself personally. But if you're getting started, sometimes that's a good way to get started. Add a little sweet. So <clears throat> extra virgin olive oil. Buy the highest quality that you can afford. I mean, there's some pretty pricey ones out there, but um, the main thing is to look at is a seal of approval. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the, the California Olive Oil Council has a seal of approval, and it's very stringent. You know, the olive oils from California are very good. Anybody here from California and you shop local, you can buy the yeah, Really, they are. Um, and this one, though, has a seal of approval from Italy. It's Italian sourced. So just turn it over in the back and see if it has a seal of approval. Then look at the use-by date on the olive oil. Ideally, you want to use that up within 6 to 12 months. So, you know, you look at this big old bottle, and, you know, this gives you an idea about how much olive oil we eat. Because, <laughs> you know, this will be for what, about 6 to 9 months for us. You know, a big bottle because we, because like I said, I you know use it for, uh, generously. Um, and then the other uh, oil that <clears throat> we consume is coconut oil, not Mediterranean, but it is in the Okinawan diet, which is the other diet that is associated with longevity. And in that diet, they consume a lot of coconut oil. Um, and you know that in the Polynesian part of the world, that is almost all they consume. And the women have beautiful skin. You know, that they look like they never age, Polynesian women. Um, and they attribute it to the fact that they consume a lot of uh, uh, coconut oil. And of course, they use it as their lotions as well. And uh, so it's kind of like, um, you know, moisturizing your skin from the inside out. Now, coconut oil has something called medium chain triglycerides. Kind of bypasses the portal system, goes directly to the liver, and is more, um, how do you want to say, 
it's used uh, quickly as energy. It doesn't get stored as fat like other fats do. So it also can be helpful in that respect for uh, you know, weight control. I, you know, honestly, we eat a lot of oil, oil in the region. I mean, coconut oil. We do. I put a tablespoon in the bottom of uh, the bowl when we have oatmeal, then put the hot oatmeal on top and it melts in there and stir it up. Mm. Great. Uh, so use it that way. Cook my eggs in coconut oil. Jim uses it in place of butter on his toast. <clears throat> so we do consume it, and I tell people, you know, if you know, consuming these healthy fats would make us fat, we'd be weighing at each 100 pounds more than we do, honestly, you know, because um, I think if you're eating the healthy fats, what happens then is that um, fat stays in your stomach twice as long as protein and carbohydrates. So when you're consuming these healthy fats, they also help with satiety. So when you have a little fat in your diet, you're not going to get as hungry as quickly, right? That's going to help you with your weight management. Another uh, benefit of the coconut oil and those MCTs is for your brain. How many of you have heard about MCT oils and brain and Alzheimer's disease? There's a lot of research going on in that area. And especially with the ketogenic diet approach, because uh, Alzheimer's disease is also caused, called diabetes of the brain. It is an inability of the, of the brain cells to uptake glucose. And so glucose is the only fuel that your brain can use except for ketones. And ketone bodies, they're called. And that's what MCT does. It helps to provide some of those ketones uh, for your brain energy, where you're not able to, as you get older and you're aging, and your brain gets resistant to using sugar, it can use the MCT oils. <clears throat> so I was at a, uh, a convention of the American Dietetic Association here about four or five years ago, and there were researchers there that were conducting research with medium-chain triglyceride fatty acids that they had put into an oil that uh, subjects with Alzheimer's disease were consuming. And these were short-chain fatty acids, specific fatty acids within the coconut oil. And they found that the, this particular MCT oil that they were using was helping to um, delay the advancement of the Alzheimer's disease. It was improving. And they were showing improvement in the brain by consuming these particular oils. Oh, and the other thing, too, is that the reason why coconut oil has actually gotten a relief on the app is because of the fact that coconut oil is high in saturated fats. But not all saturated fats have the same effect on your, on your cholesterol and your lipid profile. So it has a neutral effect on your lipids, and it's just really good for a lot of other, for a lot of other uh, reasons. OK, so getting started. So we know we're going to check out with our fats in our pantry. We're going to go take a look, right, at what's in your pantry as far as fats. Then the next thing to do is to look at how you can incorporate more fish. I think you all knew that was coming. <clears throat> so um, I just went, um, took a photo of what I have in my freezer as far as fish choices. And you can see it's wild caught. It's all wild caught except the shrimp. That was, that's not. Uh, but you know, we don't eat a lot of shrimp. Uh, we enjoy it. Jim really likes it, so I'll uh, prepare it for him. Um, but the wild caught, you're sure it's, that it's going to be a cleaner fish. And you're kind of more assured of the nutrient profile, um, less toxins, contamination. Because farm-raised fish, the nutrition of that fish um, and the amount of fat, fatty acids in that fish is going to be related to what they're feeding the fish, right? So it's hard to know for sure what kind of meal and fish food that they're feeding the farmed raised fish. Um, so when it's when you can, um, I think it's better to buy the wild caught, although any kind of fish is going to be actually probably preferable to a greasy burger, probably, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> whether it's farmed or wild caught, so keep that in mind. And then I buy mostly frozen fish. And I think I covered this last class, and that's because you get that frozen fish and it's individually wrapped in portion control, right? You can pull it out of your freezer 
one little portion or two at a time when you're just cooking for one or two, right? It's just so easy. Thought and five minutes, 10 minutes and under some cold running water, cook it up and you've got a meal really quickly, right? Doesn't take long to prepare a fish meal. You can do that pretty quickly. Um, the other thing too is uh, that when they catch the wild caught fish, they process it right on the boat. They process it right on the boat and they flash freeze it right there. So you're insured you're, you're gonna get uh, actually something that's actually really pretty fresh. There was some, I learned last class, somebody was telling me that there was a fish market up in a nice Lily's fish Lili's. market. Yes, mm -hmm. um, up in Fina. It's, it's not a fish market per se, it's an uh, Asian market, mm -hmm. but they have a lot of fresh fish. Okay, so it's an Asian market, not fish market per se, and they have a lot of fresh <laughs> fish up there. Um, so that's another, that's something I learned. So I'm learning from all of you too, so that's great. And then looking for those that are highest in the omega-3s, <clears throat> and um, I found this from the Seafood Nutrition Partnership of their website, kind of listed uh, the, <clears throat> the fish that are highest in the omega-3s. As you can see, there's quite a variety. Um, uh, this is like a thousand milligrams or more. Um, and the salmon, sardines, tuna, bluefish, tuna, uh, cod, whitefish. Um, <clears throat> over here, a little bit less, but still good. Barramundi, mussel, salmon, sea, sea bass. So you know, we get a lot of these in our, um, over in our, over in the grill, don't we? There's a lot of this on the menu over there. So when you get a chance, you can enjoy uh, the seafood on, over at the grill as well. Well, what about beef? Okay, so um, there's, <laughs> Lean beef, a nutrient-dense food. So I think beef is coming out in the bum wrap a little bit, I think. Um, I think there's been some research, confusing research out there about whether or not beef causes cancer and heart disease and all of that. And I think uh, what the concern is is that uh, a lot of the beef in the American diet is served uh, in fast food restaurants. And your, you know, your hamburger uh, fast food places, right? We're, they're getting um, too much beef and not enough vegetables and other nutrients, right? So um, lean beef in moderation three to four times a week um, actually is a, uh, new, like I said, nutrient-dense healthy food. Um, and it's, of course, it's, it's the cut and it's the quantity. And of course, if you can find it, and can afford it, um, you know, the, the you know, grass-fed beef, the organic beef, you're just gonna be sure that those are gonna be a little more cleaner, hold some food cuts. Um, but beef in general is really, really healthy. I, look what it gives in terms of what you get for nutrients. In an average three ounce serving of cooked beef, right? Cooked lean beef, uh, 175 calories and three ounces. And look at the B12, 41%. By the way, you fully can find B12 in animal sources. So anybody on a vegan diet would need to supplement their diet with B12. Um, zinc has been, we're, we're, this last couple years, we've heard so much about zinc and how important zinc is for our immune system. Almost 40% of your daily requirement for zinc in just a three ounce portion. And then look at selenium, another critical trace mineral as well, important for heart health, also for prevention of chronic diseases. And the B vitamins, you know, niacin, B6, phosphorus, riboflavin, and of course iron. And then another nutrient called choline. Choline is extremely important for your brain. It is uh, a nutrient that's uh, a precursor. Choline is a precursor of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And you need that for a healthy brain and for cognitive function. Um, the, actually, the highest source of choline in the diet is eggs. So that's another um, food that is a component of the Mediterranean diet. So <clears throat> eggs are great. Um, I read them. The, I don't know, we eat a lot of them. <laughs> it's uh, important. We like, of course, you know, protein for older adults is critically important because there's something called sarcopenia. It's kind of, it's a muscle wasting disease of older adults. 65% of older adults develop sarcopenia. It leads to frailty. It can lead to increased falls. Um, it depresses your immune system. 
So for older adults, getting high quality protein at each meal is pretty important. And that's where you would get with the beef uh, eggs, you get very high quality protein. And of course, like I said, with the eggs, you get all that choline. And over here, the leanest cuts, right? Uh, shows you that for even under, even top sirloin, for a three ounce cooked portion is um, under, right around 300 calories, so. <clears throat> and then of course, um, I buy the organic chicken. That's my, uh, that's a label that actually means something. Um, don't pay more for a label that says natural or <coughs> chilled because those are meaningless. It doesn't <laughs> mean anything. <clears throat> but the organic label is, is, is stringently controlled. Uh, so that's one that um, I like to, uh, I like to buy the organic chicken. Uh, and of course, lean pork. Actually, we had pork tenderloin last night for dinner. The, we don't eat it that often, but when we do, we really enjoy it, and it's loaded with B vitamins. B vitamins are important, critically important for older adults, again, for our brain and our immune system. Okay, so that's more on the, the beef, but um, if you remember, I mean, our, our protein foods, but remember uh, last week I talked about my eating guide, you know, with the heart puzzle and all of that. And what was at the center of that heart puzzle was uh, fruits and vegetables and whole grains as far as the center of your plate. Uh, and so that is another um, important step to going Mediterranean is eating all those fresh vegetables, a wide variety of fresh vegetables. Three to five servings today of vegetables. Um, I like to shop organic as much as I can. I was going to, um, I didn't get that slide in there. I have a slide, uh, which is uh, for the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen is a great place to start. This was developed by the Environmental Working Group. Uh, in fact, it's been out, I would say, eight to 10 years now. And so I think they've updated it. So if you go to the Environmental Working Group website, it's ewg.org. And you'll find they have something called the Dirty Dozen and the Clean, no, see, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. So if you're going, and you know here, uh, you know, if, especially if you go to a local fries store here down in Florence, it's difficult to, to find all of the, they don't have that big of an organic section. You know, you, you can go up to, uh, certainly up to Phoenix, and you can go to the Whole Foods stores there. I just learned, you know, Sprouts and Maricopa, where I was telling us last week, that's where she likes to shop. So, you know, it's difficult often to find everything organic. So this is a great place to start. You can try to shop, certainly, the Dirty Dozen and start with those. Um, and uh, buy those organic first. And that will really, according to the Environmental Working Group, those are the 12 that are the most concentrated in um, you know, plant residues. Uh, bananas are way low on the list because they got that nice big old peel on them to protect them from any kind of contamination. And why is that important? There's um, actually, there's uh, some research out showing that uh, any kind of residues of glyphosate, which is Roundup, anything that, that is, remains in the plant or gets incorporated into the plant, uh, that that can disrupt your microbiome. And so I'm going to be teaching about uh, the importance of your microbiome in a healthy gut, especially as it relates to your brain. So that'll be my next class. <clears throat> and so starting each meal with a green salad is a really great way to kind of get started, you know, with that that little homemade dressing that you're gonna make, you know, you get out your greens, put them in a bowl, toss it up with a little oil and vinegar, and start out with a green salad. By the way, you know the vinegar, or the lemon juice, it slows down the absorption of the carbohydrates after a meal. It lowers the glycemic index of the carbs in the meal. So if you have, if you're, you're dealing with some uh, high glucose, some high blood sugar, some diabetes, and um, you want to slow down the absorption of the carbohydrates in the meal is to add some vinegar to that meal. And that's a good way to do it, by starting with that green salad with oil and vinegar, right? So just a simple little trick right there. <clears throat> now, uh, this is one of the keys, I think, to eating more vegetables, is the veggie prep. So when I come home and I shop, uh, mostly my organic foods I buy at the, the big fry store out in the canal. Um, it's a little bit of a drive, but it's worth it. And as soon as I get home, I prep my veggies. Uh, so for example, I have my little containers, and I wash up my lettuce, and my parsley, I have two different kinds here, cilantro and the leaf part, regular curly leaf. 
Romade, this is the beet greens. Um, just kind of prep everything up. I usually have, always buy radishes. I didn't have any that particular day, but I always keep these, and I prep them right away. As soon as I get in the house, I prep my veggies and have them ready to go. So then it's easy. You know, you're running late some afternoon, you've been out shopping, you come home, maybe you've been over, um, you know, at a meeting, pickleball, whatever. You come home and it's 5.30 and you go, oh man, what am I gonna cook? Well, if you have your veggies all prepped, how easy it would be to just have these all prepped. Maybe you could just, you know, uh, whip out a stir fry. How quickly would that be if you had all your veggies prepped, right? Um, and this is what I do, of course, beets are another, uh, veggie we buy, I buy often. Uh, beets are just loaded with nutrition, uh, good for lowering your uh, blood pressure. And uh, <clears throat> I eat the greens. Jim doesn't eat the greens. I, I eat all the. I get to eat all the greens. <laughs> Not his favorite part of the beets. That's okay. He's like I said, he's pretty good about eating mostly anything else. But <clears throat> and then I just I prep everything. So as soon as I get my beets home. Put them in the pot, boil them up, and I've got my beets are all ready to go, right? And then I cook the greens separately, and I eat, I chop the little stalks, and this is what I do. This is one way, and this is what I do. So I get, we get all the beets. We get, don't throw the beet greens away. You want to eat those greens. <clears throat> and what about the greens? So I mean, I can aim for 100% whole grains, and I buy most of my whole greens from an online market which is thrive.com, T-H-R-I-V-E, thrivemarket.com, thrivemarket.com. And it's wonderful because I buy, most of this I bought at Thrive, except for the tricolor quinoa. Um, <clears throat> and um, they ship right to your door, which is really nice. And in three to five days, they'll ship this. And they have, a, it's like an online health food store. It's another source for us here in Robeson where we don't have quick access to a health food store. And um, this is what I have in my pantry and I just pulled out what I had there. The lentils, uh, red lentils, this makes the greatest soup. And lentils cook up in about 20 minutes. So you can whip out a really great soup. You come home, you know, I have my, I already have my celery and my carrots almost ready to go. I just have to chop those up. They're washed and prepped. And then I just chop those up, maybe it's a little onion, a little garlic, and um, then I can um, whip out a soup in about 20 to 30 minutes. Nice pot of lentil vegetable soup. Uh, this is red quinoa, which I prefer over the white because it, it cooks up more nutty and chewy and al dente. Because I think the white quinoa has a, has a tendency to become a little mushy and lose texture. Um, basmati rice is a white rice, but it has a lower glycemic index than your other short grain rices. Even though it's a white rice, it's not as nutrient dense as, of course, the brown rice. Um, this is going to take you 45 minutes, and if you need something quick, uh, sometimes I need quick rice, I'll use the basmati. The steel cut oats. Um, how many of you love steel cut oats? Oh, love steel cut oats. Yeah. I got my uh, grandkids this summer hooked on steel cut oats. So. <clears throat> so I toast it in the frying pan with a little coconut oil first. You ever tried that? Oh boy. Yeah, it gives it another little dimension of flavor. And flaxseed. Now, flaxseed mm -hmm. is your highest food source of a type of plant omega 3 fatty acid called ALA. Uh, so, ALA, some of the ALA, alpha linoleic acid, gets converted to EPA and DHA. But it's another really helpful, beneficial fatty acid for overall health and cardiovascular health. So I, uh, <clears throat> I, buy, I buy it like this, and I grind it, and I add it to a lot of different foods. Yes. So is it better ground the flaxseed, or can you eat it whole? Does it process it? You, you have to grind it. Um, to grind yes, because okay. it has a hard outer shell. Okay. If you don't grind it, it'll pass right through you. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, intact. <laughs> <laughs> so, no nutritional value. Not grind. much nutritional value that way, no. no. And so, um, okay. grind it up. I, we put it, in a, put it in our smoothies when I make our protein shakes. I add it to our, the granola bars that I make. I add it to my pancakes. I add it to anything and everything when I'm baking. I'll throw it in with uh, part of the flour, replace part of the flour in my banana bread. 
Um, it's just a great way. Not only that, you're going to get flaxseed is loaded with soluble fiber. Soluble fiber is a viscous fiber. It's gummy. You ever added water to flaxseed and notice how it kind of gets gummy? Chia seeds the same way. Um, well, that gets into your large <coughs> intestine and that gummy flaxseed will block the absorption of something called bile acids. And you need bile acids to absorb cholesterol. So it's a really simple strategy and a natural way to help to lower your cholesterol by including some flaxseed or chia seeds. I tend to like flaxseed better than chia seeds. Flaxseed's more versatile. Like I said, you can incorporate into more of your baked products than chia seeds. And flaxseed also has anti-cancer lignans. Uh, these are nutrients, phytonutrients in the flaxseed. So I'm a big fan of flaxseed, as you can see. Um, and then there's something called forbidden rice. Uh, not exactly Mediterranean, more in the Okinawan Chinese um, kind of uh, cuisine. Anybody cook with that? Anybody here ever buy the, the black rice? The forbid you have. I have. Yes, I buy it through Th Thrive Market. I found it in the local grocery stores. It is absolutely delicious, and it's beautiful on the plate with fish because you know fish is white, the plate's white, and you add this beautiful deep purple rice, and it cooks up nice and chewy, and it cooks fairly quickly, um, and it is loaded with, um, they call them anthocyanins, these purple phytonutrients that are also potent and powerful at fighting cancer as well, and chronic diseases. So experiment, try the forbidden rice. Uh, try it, cook it up, try it, and you will, you'll love it. This doesn't hardly need anything, it's just so good. <clears throat> okay, let's see, did I cover? I think I covered everything there. Um, so that's kind of in the grains category. What is, what's not pictured and what's also key components, also big components of the Mediterranean diet is farley, farro, which is a type of uh, wheat berry, kind of an uh, ancient grain, very yummy, um, couscous, right, Mediterranean, you see that. And bulgur, which is used to make tabbouleh. Anybody here make tabbouleh? Mm -hmm. I remember at the Heart Hospital, believe it or not, I was got those um, staff people, the staff and the doctors and the patients, I, we made tabbouleh with bulgur. And it's a very wholesome, healthy salad because it has tomatoes and cucumber and chopped parsley. Mint is a big component that they season it with. Um, it's just a wonderful salad, so that's another one. Barley is great too. I, we used to, we made um, barley pilaf, which we served as a side when I was at the heart of the hospital. Uh, barley pilaf, very yummy, great side with fish. And barley has beta glucans, high in beta glucans. Beta glucans, again, anti cancer nutrients, also great with lowering cholesterol. So use your food as your medicine, right? Use your food as your medicine, yeah. Okay, this is uh, pantry essentials that I have. Um, I buy this uh, from Thrive Market. I get this yellow thin tuna and canned tuna. It is so good. And it's certified as being uh, low in mercury because that's kind of a little concern with tuna, uh, especially the albacore tuna, um, the mercury content, is that's a concern. Uh, the yellow fin is going to be a little lower, and especially like this is certified low, and it's lower, and it's very, very yummy. It's very good. No real strong tuna flavor, if you don't like that. that? It's, it's called uh, Safe Catch. Safe Catch. Safe Catch. Yellow fin tuna. Always keep the, the petite diced uh, tomatoes and crushed tomatoes on hand to make my own marinara sauce. I make my own homemade marinara sauce. Yes? What about hemp seeds? Hemp seeds are great too, yes. Um, those are nutrient dense. I'm not sure if they parallel like flaxseed in terms of you know, the amount of fiber, but yes. Um, just uh, something I haven't gotten really added to my diet, but yes. Um, but I make my own. It's really easy to whip up your own marinara sauce with just if you keep uh, you know, crushed tomatoes and diced tomatoes on hand. And of course, olives. I think Jim, you eat olives every day, don't you? Yeah, all the day, keep the doctor away. <laughs> um, 
My favorite, better than bullion, soup base for making soups, canned beans. I keep a lot of canned beans on hand also for making soups. <clears throat> and then when it comes to choosing your high fiber breads, and breads, um, cereal grains, uh, especially with bread, of course, I'm a big fan of sourdough. Sourdough bread also has a lower glycemic index, which means that you're not going to get that big rise in your blood sugar after a meal. And the sourdough process makes both the gluten and the fructans, which is the fiber, more digestible. So if you're finding that if you eat regular bread and you get some bloating, you know, just feel like you're not digesting that bread, try sourdough. Now, when you buy the sourdough, um, look for um, a, a real clean sourdough that doesn't have added yeast because you want a sourdough that's a real sourdough. And the key is that um, you want to just have sourdough and the flour, the sourdough starter and flour, because they have add yeast, that means they're speeding up the process. So not getting real sourdough. Uh, the best way to make sure you're getting real sourdough is make it yourself. And that's what I started doing about a year ago. And uh, I know there's a couple people in here that have had my sourdough spelt bread, Sherry. It was that pretty, pretty great. Isn't that great stuff, that sourdough spelt? We just, we all just need to get together and do a big old baking class on sourdough <laughs> bread. Because it, and especially the spelt. Why spelt? Spelt is lower in gluten, and I am gluten sensitive. Um, and I'm finding that I can eat the sourdough bread that I make at home with spelt flour, and I just don't have any problem digesting that. I buy the organic flour from Bob's Red Mill. It's my favorite. Um, there's a couple sites if you want us to get into baking sourdough. One of my members of my last class, this particular class, that uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, she got all excited about going home and starting the baked sourdough and so we've been talking back and forth on Facebook Messenger about how she should go about doing that. Um, but breadtopia.com or King Arthur Baking, they have great, wonderful recipes. Everything and anything you need to know about getting started baking sourdough are on those websites. And it took me, I don't know, I'd say about a year, what'd you say, <laughs> to really get <laughs> <laughs> you know, really to get the technique down, you know. It took me a little while. So you have to be patient with yourself. Like, just don't, the, like, this first loaf doesn't quite, you know, you go, oh, you know, mm, uh, door stopper, probably. Um, you know. <laughs> just be patient with yourself and hang in there. And the other thing, too, is in the sourdough process and the fermentation process, there's these powerful bioactive nutrients that are produced that are so good for your immune system. So when you're eating that sourdough bread, there's no guilt. That's what I like about it, right? No guilt. <laughs> you're doing something good for your body. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, good, a good um, key indicator when you're buying bread and you want to make sure you're getting a real 100% whole grain bread. Because sometimes it'll say wheat bread on the package and you look at the label and it'll say made with wheat flour or enriched wheat flour. Well, enriched wheat flour definitely is going to mean that's white flour. And if you look down the label, it'll have maybe some caramel brown food coloring in it. So you're really getting just a loaf of white bread with food coloring. <laughs> yeah, so you gotta be smart and read your labels. So you want 100% cracked wheat or whole grain for the first ingredient, and then check your fiber content. That can also be a good indicator. Somebody said Ezekiel bread last time is a great one. It is, that's another one you can find. Sometimes a frozen food section, right? Ezekiel bread is a good one made with lentils and yeah, this grains, it's great. Um, these are some of the, what I keep in, the, in my pantry as far as the pastas. I do use the gluten-free pastas. I found these wonderful banza pastas made with chi uh, from chickpea flour. Really, really high fiber, just and really yummy, nutrient dense. This one's made with lentils, red lentils. That's another really great one. The Disparillas red lentil pastas. They're just really great. There's some great 100% whole wheat pastas out there. Oh, my keto crackers. Okay, <laughs> those are really good. Um, but see, they're made with from uh, nuts. This is a nut cracker, and they're really, really delicious. And um, I, I got this at these um, at uh, 
Costco. I believe I bought this at least at Costco. And they're very, very filling. Just, you know, like four or five crackers are just really filling. But our favorite snacks, really, we eat a lot of nuts for snacking. That's our favorite. A few organic chips, uh, but that's it. And then for dairy, so I'm winding down here. Um, remember last time, I think in the last class, I talked about how people who consume full fat dairy actually have way less? Um, that have less obesity and uh, populations that eat full fat dairy. Why is that? Um, because the dairy, dairy fat um, has something called conjugated linoleic acid, CLA. Uh, conjugated lino linoleic acids help to rip up your metabolism. Okay? So it kind of helps give you a little metabolic boost so you're burning calories faster. Uh, so these are just some, some dairy foods that I have in my pantry. This is my favorite yogurt, Faya yogurt. I use this in, in place, any place that calls for sour cream, I use the Faya yogurt. I throw a scoop in our smoothies in the morning. Uh, I use a little in cooking, like if I want to make, if I have a white wine sauce and I want to thicken it up with a little bit of something, I'll put a little bit of this Faya yogurt in there. Um, just, it's great, um, very yummy. This is a full fat aged cheese. That's just a really great choice as well. Um, lactose free whole milk, that's all I use. And of course, full feta cheese. And um, I'm gonna end with this, of course. Gotta round off the meal, right? <laughs> 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 Talked about this last week. Um, about a little red wine, especially red wine. Somebody said, what about white wine? Well, you're gonna miss out on the resveratrol if you're drinking a white wine. So yes, uh, wine is best, uh, but the white would be good as well. Uh, a little better for the red. I said, well, there's resveratrol pills you can take on you know, a supplement, <laughs> you know, with a resveratrol supplement. Um, but uh, the resveratrol, it's, it's found is in, in the grape skins. Um, but about the French paradox, is there something about the French paradox? You ever, ever heard about the French paradox? Mm -hmm. um, you know about how the French the Americans over here, we, this, is the, this is the time when we were promoting the low-fat diet, you know, low-fat diet, low-fat diet, you want to present heart, prevent heart disease, eat low-fat, eat low-fat. Um, well, that approach actually didn't work. I think it made heart disease worse. Because what happened is that people then started eating more carbohydrates mm -hmm. and more processed carbohydrates, which caused what? Caused people to produce more insulin to take care of all that carbs. Well, high insulin levels promotes heart disease and diabetes. Diabetes, number one cause of death among people with diabetes is heart disease. So that is a really wrong-sided approach, uh, that approach. Um, so um, the French paradox, because here we're in the United States, we're trying to figure out, we're all eating these fat-free crackers and fat-free fruits, right? And then over in France, right, they're loading up on all of the saturated fats and the rich foods and all of that. and they're not overweight and they don't have the level of heart disease we have and they're trying to figure it out, right? They call it the French paradox and they're thinking, they're right, could it be all that wine they drink? <laughs> <laughs> could that be it? Yeah, the French paradox. We can't figure that one out, yeah. Well, I think it's the, I think it's the whole lifestyle, to be honest. Yeah. If you go over, you know, I, was, I remember I was sitting in France and we were going on a cruise out with the SOT we were sitting there and we were waiting, waiting at this hotel and um, it was amazing to watch people just, uh, people walking by, pick it, I mean, just walk, 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 walk. People, you know, you learn that. They, they do a lot more walking over in <laughs> Europe than they do here. Um, but anyway, and you learned last week about the importance of consuming the wine with the meals, right? Because again, it's the synergy of the, the nutrients in the wine that work in harmony with the rest of the foods. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes left. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a little work session in the last 10 minutes. So what I want you to do is I want you to get together <coughs> with your table mates. You're going to come up with uh, one really uh, complete full evening meal. So you're going to compare, you're going to plan a Mediterranean dinner. So, so each, you do it as a group, you decide what you're going to have with your, and you're going to use your pantry list, see if your pantry list is there. This is what I suggest you do. 